Hello and welcome to Noel's Retro Lab. Today we aren't exactly going to be fixing a computer, we're going to be preparing it so it lasts a long time. So join me today as we look at the classic ZX Spectrum and we make sure it lasts for many years to come. So here's the ZX Spectrum board. This is actually an issue two, which is one of the oldest of the commonly available ones. And it works perfectly fine. There's uh, nothing really wrong with it, but we're going to tune it up today so it continues working correctly for a long time to come. The tune-up will consist of three different parts. We're going to replace the electrolytic capacitors. We are going to put a new keyboard membrane. And finally, we're going to replace the voltage regulator with a modern one. To replace electrolytic capacitors the way I like to do it is to take them out one at a time and then immediately replace it with the new capacitor. That way I avoid any potential problems getting two capacitors mixed up. You need to make sure that the polarity of the capacitor is correct. So you can see here the plus side is supposed to be there and the negative one is there, indicated on the board, and then the capacitor itself tells you with an arrow usually you need to be extra careful to rely mostly on the way the capacitor is currently installed and not on the markings on the board. Because in particular in this issue, the, one of these capacitors, I believe is this one, has the incorrect polarity printed on the board. It's happened to me before. I replaced it, went blindly by the board, turned it on, and I blew up one of those transistors because of it. So I'll show it to you once we get there. So let's start with this one. So the first thing I like to do is to actually identify where it is in the back. So it's this one. And I like to take some of that solder away. And I'm just going to use this regular pump instead of the fancy uh, desoldering gun. There's no need for it. I can heat up one of the terminals and just lift it. There we go. Next, if the holes are blocked, I need to remove all the, the rest of the solder in there. So for that, I'll add a little bit more fresh solder and then suck it away. Oh, here was left with some of the uh, capacitor was left in there. There we go. So this one is good, the bottom one, but this one is still not good. So we'll just do it again. Some of them are harder than others, but usually after a couple of times, you can get it all out. There you go. So now it's time to fit the new capacitor. Except that, how do we fit this there? This is what was there before. So this is an axial capacitor and this is a radial capacitor. Ideally, we should have the same kind as this one, but those that are not manufactured very much these days and they're more expensive. So I tend to use regular radial capacitors. Obviously, you need to make sure that they are rated the same. So this is 22 microfarads and 16 volts. This one is 22 microfarads, 16 volts. You can always put higher voltage. Anyway, so how do we put this here? So first of all, the plus is the long lead and the minus the other one. So you may be tempted to just do something like that and you know, fold it a little bit and do that. The problem with that is that the lead will make contact with the board in here and it will short. So we need to fold it just in a different way. This is how I typically do it. I take the long lead and I fold it over the capacitor itself like that. And then here, I fold it down like that. And then I measure it. So this needs to go from here to here. I measure roughly where it goes, which is there. And that one I 
also fold it down. So I end up with something like this, which is pretty similar, if you think about it, pretty similar to how this was there before. There we go. So, um, as you can see now, nothing is touching the board. There's no short anywhere in there. And now we just solder it as normal. That and like that, and finally, I cut the leads. I've seen some people that advocate for cutting the leads first and then soldering to prevent stress on the soldering joint. I've never seen that to be an issue. I also tried to cut the leads above the joint itself uh, to minimize any kind of stress. But if somebody has a good reference and a good reason why we should cut them before, please let me know in the comments. It's just one of the things that it's a lot easier to do it this way. So unless there's a good reason to do it otherwise, I'd rather do it this way. So here it is actually. This is the one that is wrong. Look at the capacitor. This is the positive side and that's the negative side as pointed by the arrow. But if you look on the board, it says it has the plus in there. So this is very important that we put it the opposite way that it is on the board. So we want the positive there and the negative there. a completely recapped board. So why exactly do we need to replace the capacitors? It turns out that over time, the way these electrolytic capacitors were manufactured, they lose the ability to hold the charge. You may experience things like the computer having trouble starting up. Some other times you may see like video with more interference than usual. That's probably because the 12 volt line is not holding steady. And sometimes if they're in really bad condition, the computer will just not even start up. Probably the memories will fail because the right voltages aren't getting there. With some computers, for some reason, the capacitors matter more than with others. And the original spectrums are some of the worst. So typically I just change them right away as a precaution. Also, if I'm trying to fix a ZX Spectrum board that has some kind of a problem and is not immediately something that I can identify, I will change the capacitors to rule out one potential problem because if they fail, they will cause all sorts of weird things and it makes it really difficult to diagnose other things. So did we really need to change these? We can actually test it and find out. So here's a handy device for measuring capacitance. All we have to do is put a capacitor there with the right terminal. So let's try this one. This one is a 22 microfarad, 16 volt negative lead is this one. So we'll plug in the negative lead here and the positive lead here. And it will do some reading and it says one 0.72 ohms, and then you look in this chart. So this is a, let me get it a little closer. So this is a uh, 16 volt. So 1.7 would be 
a little worse than this one. So it's a 47 microfarad. So the capacitance we're getting is higher than what it really is, 22 microfarads. So technically this is okay. It's better than the worst case, which is what this um, table indicates. Probably a brand new capacitor of 22 microfarad 16 volts will have a lower, slightly lower reading than this. Let's try it. So here we have one of the ones that we used to replace it with. And there you go. So as we expected, we get a lower reading, which indicates that it's even you know, better. So this is, this is in top shape. This is very far from the worst case of 3.6. If we read 3.6 or higher, it probably means it's, it's already causing problems. Let's do the same thing with the 100 microfarad capacitors, because in my experience, those are actually the ones that are worse off in the spectrum. Sometimes I've had problems, I've changed only those two because I was in a hurry or whatever, and suddenly things started working. So this is 100 microfarad, 16 volt as well. So we'll be looking at the same column, negative over here. Okay. And it reads 0 0.8. So 0 0.8, 0 0.8 is a little higher than 100 microfarad. You see that table? So the the worst case reading for a 100 microfarad capacitor should be 0 0.7. Anything higher than that, it means it's already past the worst case. So these guys were surprisingly, were if, if they were not giving problems right now, they will be definitely giving problems sometime soon. As a comparison, let's try a 100 microfarad brand new capacitor. There you go, 0 0.6. So yeah, that is definitely better than 0 0.7 or higher. So this one is perfectly fine. So next up, what I'd like to do is change the keyboard membrane. In this particular case, it's absolutely necessary because it's already all destroyed and, and ripped apart, but this is very normal. Unfortunately, this just happens over time. And in particular, this happens with the heat generated by the spectrum itself. With the heat and time, this becomes brittle and eventually breaks. Look at this, it just any, look at that, it's, it just breaks like nothing. So right away, this track is not conducting the signal correctly and it just stops working. With the classic ZX Spectrum and also even more so the ZX Spectrum Plus, you almost always need to change the membranes after 30 years. In this particular model, it's a little bit more difficult to replace the membrane because there are no screws, there are no latches. In order to get to it, we need to remove this metal plate, which is actually glued to the uh, plastic frame. There are some models that have a tab in here. Um, you need to bend those tabs, and then I think it's also glued. In this case, it's just it's glued. So what we're going to do is apply a little bit of heat to loosen up that glue and try to lift the plate without bending it. So for that, we'll use this hot air station and we'll set it in something not very high, like 280, and start applying it along the top and the sides. And then we'll use a tool, some plastic tool like this. Usually they sell those for um, opening cell phones. So this is very similar. You need to loosen up the glue underneath and then carefully lift the metal plate with this. Oh. Huh. This one came right up. Oh, wow. Yeah, that was barely held together with this tape. It was just, I think with time, the tape became all dried up. It's plastic mat underneath, which is actually relatively clean, all things considered. And there's the membrane. So we can just take it out through here. Like that, that goes in the garbage. And we put a new one Make sure you put the right side up. So the smaller connector on the left, like that. And now we just put everything back like this. 
And now what we need to do is apply some glue in here. What I use are some of those double-sided um, sticky strips so, and then put the metal plate on top. So I just happen to have this very thin one. Um, here you'd probably be better off with something thicker, but I just applied I just put two of them side by side and it does the job okay. Okay, so there we have it. Two sides in each of them and then one along the top. And now I'm gonna peel the plastic top just like that so i mentioned multiple times already that one of the sources of problems both for the capacitors and the keyboard membrane is the heat generated by the board of the zx spectrum where does the heat come from it all comes from this voltage regulator over here it's a 7805 and the converts 9 volts DC into 5 volts DC. The problem is that all that extra energy, all that extra wattage is dissipated as heat, and that's why we have this heat dissipator over here. So one of the things we can do is replace this voltage regulator by a modern one that doesn't dissipate any heat, like this one. This is a Traco Power TSR12450 and is a drop-in replacement for this. So it has three pins, the in, ground, and out, just like this one. We can change this, get rid of the heat dissipator completely, which is nice because it opens up the board, and just put this one in. Let's do that. can solder this in place. Perfect. This will give us the correct voltages and it will not create any heat on the board. So I hope you enjoyed this video and it gave you some good ideas on how you can future-proof your own ZX Spectrum. If you liked it, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel. See you next time.